Welcome, everybody. I'm Ernst von Weizsäcker. I'm the dean of the Donald Brent School for Environmental Science and Management at the UC Santa Barbara. I'm also teaching a course on resource productivity. Typically, we have that course in a cozy classroom. Today, we have it in a TV studio. We, from time to time, had interesting guests. So we have today Mrs. Sunita Narain, the director of the Center for Science and Environment in New Delhi. She took over that directorship from Mr. Anil Agarwal, who was a very good friend of mine, a very courageous man. He had published a book 20 years ago or so on the state of the Indian environment at the time and almost nobody really in India cared about that state of the environment. And it was a blockbuster event, you know. At that time, I believe you also have been at the center already. Now, in our days, when people in America or in Europe talk about global warming or the state of the global environment or so, there is a typical reaction of saying, well, what can we do? We are so few. But when China and India now with huge growth rates start off, uh, our contributions will be minimal. So let first the Chinese and the Indians do their homework and then we will perhaps join. Sunita, how would you react to this? <laughs> <laughs> I think, Ernst, you've exactly said it. The question is that if so few people in the world can create such devastation, the question then to ask is that if larger number of people do the same, Yes, it will completely destroy the world. But the question to ask is that what is it that makes it so devastating that such few people can literally degrade and pillage this Earth's resources in this way? And it's really, it's an opportunity for us to understand that it's not about India and China, but it's about the Western model of development in which we have used our resources so intensively that such small populations in the world have really led to such great amount of degradation. It's a time for us to critique what small groups of us can do, what wealth and richness in the world can do, not just what poverty in the world can do. And I always say this, um, you know, if you think back on it, um, you know, before India got its independence, um, Mahatma Gandhi, who you've all heard of, uh, wrote a book where he asked himself questions and he also gave answers. And one of the questions was a fascinating one where he is asked or he asks himself, what would he like free India to be? Would he like free India to be like Britain? Would he like free India to have what everything that Britain has? And, the, and Mahatma Gandhi answers saying, no, he doesn't want free India to be like Britain. And the person who's asking the question says, but why not? I mean, why would you not want India to have everything that Britain has? It has all the wealth, it has the roads, it has the railroads, it has everything. And Gandhi replies, if it took Britain the rape of half the world to be what it is, how many worlds would India need? And I think it's time when something as devastating, as catastrophic as climate change, global warming looms over all of us, which virtually talks about threatening the way we live, the way millions of people will live and will survive in this world. I think it's time for us to be far more serious about this question, that what is it about our development which is leading to such amounts of environmental degradation? It's not time for us to point at India and China, but it's really a time to point to us, at all of us, and to critique that development model. This is the opportunity that we have. Picking up on Gandhiji's uh, reference to a number of planets mm. that we would need, mm. I'm sure you have heard of the ecological footprints. Yes. Mm. 
the ecological footprints of Europeans and Americans are somewhat larger than those of Indians. Much larger, much larger. And that's always been the big issue for us, that if you're looking at, if you're looking for, a, for someone who comes from India, who's looking at India's environmental issues, we have two challenges. We have a challenge as a global environmentalist, one to argue that the footprints of the rich in the world, whether it is the rich in the rich world or it is the rich in the poor world, which is rich in our part of the world as well, our footprints are too big and they are not bearable for this earth to sustain. There is also another issue for us to argue is that what is it that India and I don't know China so well, but what is it that India and perhaps China need to do to make sure that we can reinvent our pathways to growth? What is it that we can do to make sure that um, we do have growth, but without the pains of environmental degradation? And I think that those are the two issues that I see us in, 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 in India grappling with, because the, the big issue that does come out for us is that if you look I was talking about the development paradigm that exists in, in the West. And if you look at it from where I sit in Delhi, you understand the sheer, sheer senselessness of that paradigm. I mean, it's both resource intensive and it's capital intensive. Yeah. It's resource intensive and as a result of it, it uses a lot of energy, it uses a lot of material, it generates a lot of waste. And so it essentially has major environmental impacts. It's capital intensive. It uses a huge amount of money. And because it uses that amount of money, it creates a difference between the rich and the poor. And if you do look at the ecological history of the world and you look back and you think about it, that's exactly what happened in your part of the world. When you began the process of intensive use of resources post the World War II period, you had huge problems of toxification, huge problems of environmental degradation. You know, you had the London th uh, smog incident. You had every one of your rivers was as dirty as our river today. Every one of your cities was as polluted as our cities today. But what you needed to do was to invest a phenomenal amount of capital to be able to mitigate the adverse impacts of growth. And you could invest that capital because your growth came after a huge period of colonization, which means you had capital accumulation, which you could invest back into mitigating the adverse impacts, whether it was so social or whether it was environmental. That's why you needed the social security schemes, because of the vast differences that would come between the rich and the poor. You had to mitigate that. Now, we are coming to it at a stage when we are much poorer than you were when you began that stage of intensive growth. The cost of um, oil is much higher, which means the cost of growth in some senses is much higher. And we want to do the same thing that you did with much fewer resources. And that's really the challenge for Indian environmentalists to argue and to challenge and say that that is not the way that we will be both rich as well as healthy and that we will have to reinvent. And the big issue for us really comes out is, and that's really a challenge which I know that you are all learning, I mean, you're all grappling with and you're all very aware of, is the sheer mindlessness of the system, that you're constantly investing but remaining behind the problem you create. And I, can I give this example always of air pollution that, you know, you had, you, you started off in the 80s with a pollutant called SPM, suspended particulate matter. And you said, you know, here is something that creates a health impact. And you brought in new technology, you cleaned up your fuel, and you monitored your air and you said, you know, whether it was air in LA or whether it was air in, in, um, in London, you said, oh, it's cleaner, it's, our SPM levels are down. But then science got cleverer and it monitored and it said, oh, but it's not SPM we need to worry about, it's RSPM, res respirable suspended particulate matter. The smaller the particulate, the deeper it goes into your body. 
and then you innovated again and you brought in new technology you cleaned up your fuel you went from 500 ppm of sulfur down to 10 ppm of sulfur and you said you now our cities are clean we're sort of meeting rspm standards so no 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 but it's not rspm it's pm 2.5 and then the new studies came out and said, oh, but you know, that's really deadly. And as you've innovated with technology, you have reduced the size of the particulates to the extent that it goes even deeper. So a new, you know, new technologies and new fuel quality was sort of innovated with, investment was made. And now when you've, you've got PM 2.5 standards, scientists are saying, but as you've reduced the PM, your NOx has gone up. Because the technology is of a kind, when it reduces particulates, another pollutant goes up. So now you have new investments taking place to clean up the NOx. And all this, and all this time, the numbers of cars have gone up. That was the fundamental problem. And you've never dealt with the sheer numbers. And the problem is that even if you've dealt with local air pollution, you've created a horrendous global air pollution problem of global warming. So, the question that we have today is to ask ourselves in India that can we afford this route of incrementally keeping ahead or keeping behind the problem that we keep creating? The incremental technology route or is there a new leapfrog for us? And that's really the problem that, that, that concerns us. <coughs> Very good you say that. Let me have two remarks that amount to a question. Hmm. One. The typical way of looking at environmental pollution is related to s the so-called Kuznets curve of pollution, saying that if you plot pollution upwards mm -hmm. and the development of time and of prosperity mm -hmm. to uh, this dimension, then countries start poor and clean then they develop and become rich and dirty and then they are so rich they can clean up pollution mm -hmm. and they end up rich and clean, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful, comfortable paradigm. Mm -hmm. And this leads to exactly the kind of um, chain mm -hmm. of ever more expensive, mm -hmm. allegedly ever cleaner, but sometimes even counterproductive strategies. Mm -hmm. But the self-defense of that system mm. is always this lovely mm. Kuznets curve. Mm. Now, you have taken a very bold step a couple of years ago in initiating a popular movement against air pollution in Delhi mm. by saying, why not just ban diesel or other dirty fuels and go for compressed natural gas? Mm. That has been a success story. I mean, I've, I've been in Delhi from time to time. Last time I visited you, uh, the air was reasonably clean. I mean, mm. it was not exactly um, a spa mm. kind of um, mm. air, but it was, it was all right. Mm. So you have to be applauded for, for this great campaign. Can you tell us something about it? No, I can, but I, I, I disagree with the Kuznet curve. I have to tell you that well, before I... Well, I, uh, I believe I presented <laughs> in a way yes. inviting you to disagree. <laughs> I disagree with it. I think uh, Mr. Kuznet didn't quite understand um, how, um, how incapable human beings are in being able to deal with uh, environmental degradation the way we are creating it. And I think to believe, unless you were to reinvent the way you would look at the environmental issues completely, and I will come back to it. But on Delhi's air, and it, it brings me a little bit about, and you can plot the Kuznet in it um, uh, to some extent. Um, I mean, Delhi is a typical city. Um, we, uh, we never even talked about air pollution because we didn't have a problem of pollution. We, we essentially had a lot of other problems, but never really one of air pollution till the mid 90s. In the mid 90s, suddenly we woke up one morning and said, oh God, the air is so foul. We just cannot breathe. And just about everybody was having an asthma problem. And you know, you just had this black smoke hanging all over you and your cities. And, it was very bad. And we started, we, we're a research organization. We do research on environmental issues. We call ourselves a knowledge-based research, um, um, I mean, knowledge-based activist group. So what we did was to do a lot of research understanding, well, what is the nature of the problem? And we looked at, 
you know, we looked at technology, we looked at fuel, we looked at um, you know, all the different issues and we essentially came up with a book which we call Slow Murder. We called it slow murder because we said that this is, you know, air pollution is something like murder. It just, it's a deliberate killing of another human being. Uh, but it is not done as an instantaneous thing. It's done slowly over time because if you keep polluting the air, you essentially create um, health conditions which both lead to morbidity and mort mortality. And because we are an activist group, we also put on the cover of our magazine, Down to Earth, um, two faces. One was the top in Indian industrialist, Rahul Bajaj, who makes our scooters, uh, three-wheelers. And the other one was the then environment minister. And of course, we put the third one, the petroleum minister. And we called them slow murderers. We said that these were the people who were really responsible because they hadn't cleaned up and they hadn't done enough. That then led to a fair amount of understanding about the need to bring changes in a city like Delhi. But that's really where the differences are, that on one hand, we are a rich country, or getting rich. We have larger numbers of cars. We have larger motorization rates. But we don't have the kind of wealth that it requires to be able to manage that motorization to, to make sure that our local air pollution is kept clean. So we can't phase out the dirty technology. We can't you know, clean up um, the diesel that is required. I mean, our diesel levels at that time had 10,000 parts per million of sulfur in them. Currently, to give you a comparison, in Europe, you've got 50 ppm of sulfur in your diesel. So just understand the levels that we had. And we had it because we are essentially a poor country, which is trying to, to, to develop um, as, as fast as possible. And, and can't afford to put into, um, into these efficiencies. So we essentially argued that one of the routes for India would be to think about cleaning up, but not to take the incremental route that, say, Europe or the US have taken. US have, has consistently tightened its emission standards, going from tire one, tire two, tire three, Europe, Euro one, Euro two, Euro three. We, at that time, were at India zero. And we said that the best way for us to do would be to actually reinvent it by going on to gas, compressed natural gas, which had particulates levels were very low. And so essentially arguing that if you changed your fuel, you would get the equivalent in emission terms that you would get if you had cleaned up your diesel or your petrol up to the level of Europe today. And that gave us a sort of five to six year um, breathing space, if you may say, that leapfrog. So we essentially moved to compressed natural gas, and we moved to running our buses using compressed natural gas. And that gave the city of De Delhi a certain amount of you know, clean air and, and breathing space, as I say. I call it breathing space because it isn't enough. We add 400 vehicles a day into my city. 400 new vehicles are registered a day in my city. And we do not have the money to be able to phase out the dirty vehicles that are existing on the road. We do not have the money to be able to check the backside of every car that is required or, or innovate with the scooter technology, which is really the first form of motorization that happens in our part of the world. So, the question now for us, that next leapfrog is, well, what can you do now? And the, the only, the, the big option for us is, can you really reinvent the way that you do mobility planning? Can you really reinvent the way that you actually plan for your cities so that you don't have to plan along cars? You can plan along public transport. But you do it at a scale which is never done in the rest of the world. Perhaps the only city in the world which has planned for public transport singularly is Singapore. Other than that, there is no city that has planned to be a public transport driven city and that automobiles, if bought, stay at home but are not necessary. But that's really the mental challenge that we have today, which is to think that can you actually replan that mobility? Now, if you were to think about it on a coarse net curve, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you know we have to get wealthier to be able to do so yeah. it means that even when we are poorer we can substantially clean up if we make changes in the way we think and the way we develop our development strategies and i think if you keep getting wealthier and you keep cleaning up you get into a vicious cycle of essentially creating a business of polluting and the business of polluting is good if you are essentially a rich society but the business of pollution is bad if you are not a rich society there is no wealth that you can create out of the dirty business and i don't think that when i look at global warming i do not think that even the wealthiest of nations in this world can today argue that being wealthy means that we have been able to take care of our environment because we have never seen that that means <clears throat> you are definitely not saying we should stay poor no but you say if we begin tackling environmental problems when we are still poor yes. it is much better both for wealth and mm -hmm. the environment that's right and we can become wealthier <laughs> by tackling our environmental problems in a different way of course or by yes. generating wealth yeah. in a different way meaning then also that the rich countries can learn from your experience well there are no role models right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now senator our seminar is chiefly on resource productivity yes. meaning to extract more wealth well-being out of one cube meter of water mm -hmm out of one kilowatt hour out of one barrel of oil out of one ton of copper ore or whatever that in a sense means the same agenda that you are um talking about mm -hmm. let me try and find out from you if this also applies to water productivity water efficiency does that make any sense for oh, you oh absolutely absolutely and i think the biggest issue for a country like india um, <coughs> and i presume where i'm sitting in california i know water has been a very contentious issue as well and a very difficult issue as well but i do know that in my country water is going to make or break india as i keep saying you know it's um, if we can get our water maths right we will survive as a country if we get our water maths wrong you know you can get all the missiles and the nuclear power stations and do whatever else of the gizmos but you know if you don't get your water uh, r um equations right you're in trouble and a lot has to do with productivity i mean it's there there are two things that we must understand here that when you're looking at productivity again you must understand the knowledge of the poor in the productivity business because it is often assumed that the poor are inefficient and the poor waste and the poor don't know how to get the maximum out of uh, their resources and that what you need is the input of modern technology and modern science to bring in more efficiencies i think one of the big issues that we have learned over the time particularly when it comes to water is that it is really the knowledge of the poor and of the communities that we must learn for from and that that is the starting point for us to understand how in the case of water you can become more efficient in the use so the poor make intelligent use of scarce resources absolutely absolutely and especially in water if you look at water two major things two most fascinating things one in terms of how they will harvest water uh one of my most remarkable and you know you have these experiences in life which really teach you a lot one of my experience was with anil i went to um, cherapunji which is uh, this uh, part of india you know we in india love to be the highest the tallest the biggest the richest the poorest you know we have one of those obsessions um and this is one of those places where which has the highest rainfall in the whole world okay cherapunji at least that's what every indian believes uh, um it's 14000 mm i i don't know this in inches so you'll have to sort of work this out but it's a lot of rain and um when i went there it has a sign that says in the government guest house saying water is scarce please use it carefully okay 
14,000 millimeters of rainfall, 14 meters of rainfall a year, water is scarce. The very next month, we went to this amazing fort city of India, Jaisalmer. It's at the border of Pakistan. It's in our desert. You get 50 millimeters of rainfall, so 14,000 millimeters, 50 millimeters. I mean, just to give you a comparison. Uh, this is a, a desert city. It's a fort city. It's made out of yellow sandstone. And if you ever come to India, this is a phenomenally beautiful city. Um, it was a caravan route for all the trade that happened between West Asia and India. As you know, it's a very major trading route before we got all the borders. Um, no recorded history that the town had ever been evacuated because of a lack of water no recorded history, 50 millimeters of rainfall. And when you start understanding it, you understand the wisdom of how you harvested water and how every drop of rainwater was harvested. It was harvested in a tank, in a pond, on the rooftop, carried, collected in, 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 in cisterns, under the house. Every place you harvested every drop of water. So you maximized your yield. And those miniature catchment areas were kept clean, of Absolutely, course. Absolutely, because you knew that if you polluted your catchment area, it would get into your water, and that the same water you would be drinking. So, you know, one of the most fascinating technologies was as you drive through, you'll find these sort of saucepans, you know, or these uh, what you would think is spaceships, you know, these round sort of circular domes all over. Uh, and you'd say, oh, you know, maybe it's a temple, maybe it's a mosque, something, you know. You s ask, what is it? It's, it's a well. And what people do is to make an artificial catchment, and they will pave that catchment, and the center of the catchment, they will make the slope, they will pave, and in the center, they will make a well, and then they will cover the well. And that the maths of it is that one hectare of land, I'm sorry, I know this is America, and I know that all... The way we measure is not the way you measure. And you'll just have to work this out. But uh, one hectare of land, 100 millimeters of rainfall, gives you a million liters of water. That's the maths of this. And it's, it's, it's something that we have to understand that how that knowledge helped people to optimize on what was the available resources. But the second part of it is, and that's what we need to learn from, is they also optimized on the use of that resource, scarce resource. So it was not just that you optimized on, on collecting it, but you also made sure that you used it very prudently. So for instance, we had huge diversity in our cropping patterns. And the cropping patterns were very dependent on the amount of water that was available. So you made sure that your, your, your crops were va valued every drop of water. And the food you ate and the biodiversity that we had in this world was therefore, or the cultural diversity that we had in this world, was a natural outcome of this biological diversity. This culture was not in need of genetically engineered drought-resistant plants. It was not. Now, I would not I, I would not say that I'm not. A, I would not say that today you don't need to do that. Okay, but you need to value first the knowledge that existed, and the knowledge that said that you had a diversity in what you ate, and a diversity that was dependent on the ecosystem and the available resources. If today we are introducing genetically modified crops almost as a single bullet answer. And we say, it doesn't matter what you eat. We can all eat in McDonald's, and we can all eat the same kind of food. But G will solve, genetically modified food will solve the problem. That's not the way it's going to work. If you want to have modern science and technology to aid in this process, then modern science and technology must respect both the diversity and the knowledge that existed. It cannot be built on a different paradigm which believes that you know it's just technology and it's not about um, a, a culture or a society and a prudent or resource prudent society it's not a, a resource wasteful society with all a genetic modified food will still go hungry or it'll be obese um, let me try to link this 
fascinating concept of water harvesting to the efficiency agenda. I seem to understand that local water harvesting traditionally is associated with a very efficient use of this gas resource, while huge big dam schemes supplying a lot of water yes. tend to be associated with wasteful use of, of water. Is that the case? Well, you know, if you look at the economics of this, um, Ernst, and you start looking at the resource efficiency issues, it becomes very clear, and the more I'm understanding this, that there's such parallels between water and energy yes. on this issue. Your biggest losses that are coming up are really coming up in the transmission and the distribution systems that mm -hmm. are getting created. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at water, the, the, what becomes very clear is that if you have large systems, and I have to confess to you, I'm not ideologically against large systems. Uh, if you have large systems, what it does is that it's very efficient in collecting a lot of water in one place. And there's no doubt about it that you collect a lot more, you have much higher returns on, on, on your investment in that one instant. But then there are two major problems. One, because it's very capital intensive, you have to find a way for it to pay back. Now you can't find a way to pay back because you need to be able to distribute that water to large numbers of people across the country. And to distribute that water, you have to invest in distribution lines, which then become very um, 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 inefficient in the way they supply. So you have very high levels of losses, which then means that by the time you supply that water to households, the cost of it is too high for either farmers or households to pay for. And so what happens is that either you can pay, subsidize a very small segment of your farmers or a very small segment of your urban households or your industrial households, but you cannot subsidize the vast majority of people. Okay. So in, in resource efficiency terms, it then becomes important for us to understand that would it not be more cheaper and cost effective if you were to harvest your rain and depend first on local water harvesting, reduce your distribution costs as much as possible, supply the water, be able to bill for that water because people will be able to pay for water which is cheaper as well. You can recover your cost, you can put it back into operation and maintenance costs that you need to. And because it is also local, you can also make sure that you can take back the sewage, for instance, in this mm -hmm. case, that is generated, and you can recycle it as well. Because you haven't thought about taking the sewage long distance again, which makes it again very expensive for you to recycle and, and reuse. Now, in this paradigm, I would argue that I have no problems if you did make a dam and you said that the deficit of this local water harvesting, I will make up with a larger um, um, system that I bring in. But it would be far more efficient if you were to use your rainwater because it is a local source. It will cut down on your inefficiencies. It will make it easy for you to be able to recover your costs and to be able to then connect the resource to the people. That's a very um, persuasive concept to me. If I was on the jury of the Stockholm Water Prize, I would say this is a great thing. And uh, actually, <laughs> Sunita won the Stockholm Water Prize a couple of years ago, um, meaning essentially that you start with the decentralized, intelligent use of water in the That's first right. place and take the larger structures as a fallback That's right. and not have the big schemes in the first place, because they have a tendency of an overkill of supplies, which then could destroy the tradition and uh, habits of um, intelligent use. That's right. And also the big schemes lead to inefficient use and yes. are unsustainable over the long term. Okay. So, but the point, and I think the reason why Ernst all this becomes more difficult than the words that we are putting into is because the kind of thing that we are talking about which is distributed growth and decentralized growth also demands deepening of democracy. 
It means yeah. that you have to give the institutions to be able to manage those resources. You're talking about a new form of governance. So environment and resource efficiency then doesn't become a politics neutral term. It becomes a political term because you cannot have a resource efficient model in the way I am looking at it unless you talk about a deepened, a very devolved, rich, democratic framework in which local communities have the right to be able to manage their resources. Sunita, so the biggest uh, media coverage that you presently enjoy <laughs> is about soft drinks, Coca-Cola, and Pepsi and others, but you have often said in public that you are not criticizing the suppliers of soft drinks uh, so much as you criticize your own government for not, apply, for not adopting and applying standards, which of course uh, is a different actor. I mean, the government, the democratically elected government, should act um, mm. on behalf of the people. Is that your position? You yeah, absolutely. I keep saying, well, I didn't think that we had elected Coke and Pepsi as our government. Not yet, at least. <laughs> so, um, in which case, my big issue is that it's the government of India which has to set the standards. And the two issues that we've been raising in this is one, that we have a bigger problem with contamination. We have a contamination um, of our food stuff. And we're essentially saying we're too poor a country to be able to first contaminate and then clean up. So we want to be able to drive regulations which actually reduce and minimize the contamination. So we want stringent standards now. We want tough standards now. We want enforcement now. So that you don't first make sure that all your food and water is so contaminated and then you start putting in the regulations and you start cleaning up and the surveillance and things like that. And the other is we're essentially saying that, you know, we are, unfortunately, and I think it's unfortunate because um, I think there are healthier um, um, ways of, of eating, but um, we are getting into having more and more processed food um, pretty much along the lines that the rest of the world is. So we are also arguing that the government must set, set standards for the quality of processed food, which will include both the toxins and the contaminants that are allowed or not allowed in the processed food. And it also includes the nutrition and the nutritive value um, of these foods. And uh, essentially arguing that, again, India is too poor a country to be obese and to go through the diseases of the rich world. Uh, we cannot afford to first get fat and then say, oh, we have diabetes and now we need a huge lot of uh, medicines to deal with it. We already are dying out of diarrhea. And so we need, and malnutrition. So we really need to be able to deal with uh, this uh, challenge in a more intelligent fashion. And that's really where Coke and Pepsi also fit in. I mean, we had tested the drinks. We found pesticides in it. Our issue with them is twofold. One is that we found pesticides, which means that they need to clean up. And they need to clean up because they were using groundwater, which they were not cleaning up um, so that in making their final product. And we want government to set the standards because I don't believe that um, we should have a world in which companies voluntarily tell you that, you know, we are clean and they will put out the advertisements and say, you know, our film stars endorse us and they tell us and they tell you that we are clean, so we are clean. I still believe that there is a role for government and regulations and that um, you need to strengthen your regulatory institutions. And I think that's a challenge for America as well, because I think the weakening of the regulatory institutions in the rich world is a bad sign for you, and it's a terrible omen for the rest of us. Um, and it's something that we need to learn together, how we need to tighten it. And the larger issue for us is that we want to make sure that we don't contaminate all our other food stuff. So it, yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one because it's such a, um, I mean, they're unfortunately very big companies. <laughs> now, Sunita, um, this, of course, is a university class. Yes. And typically, we have a lot of discussion yes. in such class. And I would, I would love to introduce each one of the students individually. It's such a wonderful class. I yes, enjoy I it tremendously. Uh, would any one of you like to ask a question to Sunita Narayan. 
Yes, Maria Mircheva. So my question is about the unique things about India. So when I think of India, there are two things that pop up in my mind as a unique situation. And one of them is the huge population. And the other one is the caste system. Mm -hmm. And I was actually recently in India and I could see that both of them. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how do you propose, how, what kind of role do you think those factors play in, in, in the environmental issues and how do you propose to deal with them? For example, I was trying to use a model that from other countries mm -hmm. about organizing a community to clean water and stuff like that. And I was asked the question, but only the people from the lowest class deal with cleaning and water. Mm -hmm. So how would you get a leader, mm -hmm. somebody from the highest caste, to actually lead this project? No, it's a very good question, Maria, and a very tough one as well. I mean, there are no easy answers to this. Um, I mean, population is a very important issue. It's clearly, you know, the higher the number of people, the more pressure it will exert on the resources. But the point for environmentalist is that it's not the sheer numbers, but it's the consumption of the numbers. And you have to understand this, that, you know, it's still the vast numbers of people in India, over a billion people that we are, we still consume much, very little of the Earth's resources as compared to a minuscule number of people that exist in this country, for instance. And that has, that we must remember that. Even if we have a problem of the sheer numbers, which is another kind of a problem, we must understand the connection between population and consumption. The other issue with population is that I believe very strongly that population is not a state matter. It's really, a, a, an, it, it's really about people. And it's about people because at the end of the day, the biggest link that we have found between population and reducing numbers of, um, of, um, of um, population, the link is with female literacy. There is no other solid link that has ever been made. It's not wealth per se. There are wealthier parts of India where ch the numbers of children are still going up or if they have, they're killing off the girl child because they want to make sure that they, they have just the male uh, child, which is you know just incredibly stupid and asinine to do, um, um, if not criminal. Uh, but it's, the link is with female literacy. And so therefore, it's a good it's a, it's, a, it's a developmental value. It's a value that we have to push and ask for and, and scream for and say, every girl child in India has to be educated. Every girl child in India must have the right to decide. It's about female empowerment. It's about the empowerment of women. And the link that you can make, and it's a very interesting link uh, that you can make with environment is that the load that the, fee that the girl child has in a degraded environment is massive. One of the key reasons that we found for dropout of girl child from school in say the Himalayan region of India was not just because the school was far, far away, in fact the school was very close to the village, was because the girl child was needed to help the mother in the extraordinary work burden that women have when the environment degrades, whether it is to get water, whether it is to get fuel wood, whether it is to get fodder. So the, the big issue then is that if we get our development right, if we can get our a rural ecosystem regenerated, if you can make sure that the work burden is, is less on women and if you can make universal compulsory education so that every child in India has to go to school. I think population is something that it is something that this and my country can deal with. The caste system is far more difficult, it's far more rooted, it's far more messy in certain areas but I think that's why all of us at whichever top levels of class or caste have to talk about excreta. I don't talk about sewage in India. I talk about excreta, okay? Because I think it's an important message. We need to say that it's, you know, if we can all talk about excreta and we can all make sure that, you know, this is an issue that's a societal issue and it's not just about the lower caste, but it's really about the rich in the country which are creating a problem. 
then you bring a class debate into it and you, you, you get out of the caste debate. But it's a tough one. It's a very tough one, which is what makes India so tough and so fascinating. More questions? Yes, please. I can't see you. So uh. you were talking about the, the different ways that, sorry, the Western model of development yeah. Yeah. will not work yeah. for India. And so you mentioned a couple of ways that perhaps India can sort of shortcut this, the Kuznets curve, one of which being um, the distributed water yes. issue. Or um, I'm wondering how energy falls into India. How, Interesting. What are some ways that you see as India being able to not get large scale and then pollution related and then have to clean it up with regards to energy use? Well, the energy model is very much like the water model. I mean, um, I'm dreaming here. Huh? I mean, you, you, you know, don't, 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 don't tell me that, you know, but you're doing it completely the opposite. I'm dreaming. But if I was to dream, I would say the same thing. I would say it's far more, I mean, all the figures I've seen of energy uh, costs, I'm seeing more and more losses in transmission and distribution um, costs. So essentially, I would argue the same. I would say a distributed form of energy so that, you know, Biofuels, for instance, is something that everyone is talking about today. Now, I mean, can you think of an India in which everybody essentially grows their biofuel and you have good processing units and you essentially create and you make energy and you use it at a distributed level so that each village in India, rather than getting energy supplied from the Gulf first to India and then to, to Mumbai and then to our 600,000 villages across, actually each village has its own form of energy generation management, perhaps a, a, a distribution company which is spread out amongst 50 villages across which uh, uses either solar or micro or all the distributed forms of energy that we're talking about today, fuel cells. You know, it's, it's a phenomenal future that we have. We have an option. We're not grid connected today. We can remake our energy future. We can do it differently. The question is, and this is really the question that I would like to leave with all of you, the problem is that because everything that we are being told in our planners and our thinkers and all the people who go to Harvard and Yale and London School of Economics and perhaps to the Brent School, perhaps not to the Brent School, I hope, <laughs> who get this message, but in the other schools, they get this message that no, all this is cute solutions, but they're not workable. They're, they're, they're on the edge. The real solutions come out of what we do, which is centralized forms of energy, large power stations, nuclear, hydro, thermal, large distribution systems. That's the efficient model. Because what I am also saying is that the efficient model that I am talking about is also politically different. It is not a centralized politics. It is a decentralized politics. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough one, but I think that's where the future is. Let me inject at this stage an experience I learned from one of our wonderful group projects. At the Brent School, we ask all students to do a group project for half or one year with a real-world client. Mm -hmm. And one of the group projects work, worked on the water energy nexus. Uh -huh the water needed to produce energy, in this case, electricity. It came out, if biomass, hmm. which can be a good thing, yes. is transform transformed into uh, large-scale plantations of biofuels hmm. to supply um, burnable materials mm. for power plants, mm. the water demand mm. is five times more Fascinating. than with coal fire plants or with nuclear. Fascinating. And that in dry mm. California. Mm. So it would make things worse, worse absolutely. with those beloved biofuels. Mm. So uh, what you say mm. also has a bearing mm. on what biofuels do yes, you mean? Absolutely. Do you mean centralized plantations, yes. Yes. which make things worse, worse, or do you mean mm. village kind of uh, biofuels that make villages in India mm. 
less dependent on the centralized grid. That's right. No, I think, I think that's we are talking about, and I think that's where in this generation of the environmental consciousness, we must understand that we are not talking about politics neutral technology options. We are talking about uh, technological options and which are, which have politics in it. And the politics is different. And we have not to be scared to say that. And I think in some senses, that's where my, my hope for this next 10 years is that if we have a crisis of climate change on all of us, it is scary. It is really scary. Coming from a country like India, where our glaciers are melting, where 40% of our fresh water reserves comes, or supplies comes from glaciers, I'm scared out of my wits. What does it mean for India in the future? Senator. We have perhaps three or four minutes left. Mm -hmm. And as you now touch global warming, mm. let me ask you one question. You have been advocating, together with Anil Agarwal, the idea of a worldwide carbon dioxide trading system based on a per capita permit. That's right. Meaning that you would have one billion permits mm. in India mm against 300 million mm. permits for, for the US, mm. uh, just in accordance yeah. with mm. the uh, population size. What would that mean? What would that imply? Well, essentially, again, it's about arguing that the, global, that the atmosphere is a global common and that you know, each human being has a right to that global common and that we cannot freeze inequity in the world. We cannot say that we know that the, the, the growth of our economies is linked to the growth of CO2 emissions. And so you cannot freeze inequity. You have to share growth um, mm. equitably. <coughs> and so essentially develop a model in which you create a permit system in which each human being has the right, if you want, to pollute in the world, but an equal right to pollute. You create a trading system built on it. You create then the incentives so that the people who do not pollute get the incentive to, to do things differently so that they can actually keep trading in their emissions. And I would go a step further and say that even in my own country, I would develop an intra-national, so not just an international, but an intranational permit stay system so that the rich and the poor, so that the trading system make sure that it is the poor who do not use their share of the global emissions actually benefit from it. So the rich would have to go shopping would have for to permits. Go to, absolutely, even in my own country. Yes. So that you would actually create the kind of distributed energy future that we are talking about today. You would create the right incentive for it. You know, there is a possibility to bring that change. There is a possibility for us to do things differently if we understand that it will demand one phenomenal amount of cooperation amongst people across the world. You cannot talk about running the world today uh, based on um, either might or bullying or, you know, or dictates. You will need the cooperation of the rich and the poor together. And I think based on that, you can come up with models which, in which the poor and the rich can learn to live and share. And this is one That's model. a very uh, exciting idea because it also relates to the impasse that we are facing with the Kyoto Protocol. That's right. That's um, right. The American Senate has made a unanimous decision before Kyoto mm -hmm. not to join any commitment unless the major in developing countries are making commitments themselves in a meaningful way. However, the developing countries have said, unless the rich countries do their homework first, we are not going to join. No, the developing countries are saying something else. They are saying that we need the space to grow. Of course, They are yes. saying that you have to reduce so that we can grow. Right. Okay? They are saying something quite so different. Even stronger. Okay? Even yeah, stronger. Of course. And I agree with that. Uh, I do. <laughs> but your per capita permit system That's right. would be, in a way, the way out. Because it would be an invitation to developing countries to make use of their growth potential while at the same time keeping the pressure of leaving some permits for sale. Absolutely. Uh, that would be economically more beneficial. 
Uh, and that would lead to some kind of an efficiency revolution, both in the north and the south, absolutely. by making better and more efficient use of the scarce resource. No, absolutely. I think that is, that is the way, I mean, we have to think along these lines, but it, the, the one thing that the rich nations have to understand when it comes to global warming is that there is a fundamental issue of equity and of sharing resources. That unless we, we address that, we are not going to move ahead. And that the per capita entitlement system is one step or a big step in accepting that. Thank you very much. The hour is over. Thank you. <laughs>